I'd like to welcome you to this online CME program entitled Practical Orthopedics for Primary Care. This section will be on the evaluation and treatment of back and spine pain. This is an extraordinarily relevant topic for primary care providers as it is about the third most common reason for people presenting to an office for evaluation. And all of you have seen plenty of patients with back pain. Many times these patients are the most frustrating patients that we see because back pain, neck pain, spine pain are all quite unpredictable in terms of their clinical course and there's a huge variation between how individuals react to this. We hope that through this conference we will give you a better understanding of the actual function of the spine, the anatomy of the spine, the degeneration that is part of normal aging, the common disorders that people will present with to your practice, and some practical strategies for managing these. We will also talk about some of the advanced treatments that are now available with surgeries and procedures. We hope that this helps you be, become better practitioners in your office because obviously musculoskeletal care starts with primary care providers. I'll be giving the first lecture of these series and I've decided to give a lecture on spine anatomy and common developmental variants. The reason that I decided to do this is not because primary care providers have not been educated about the spine. It's because with the acquisition of diagnostic studies, you must now read reports that include all kinds of descriptions of things, some of which it's hard to judge their clinical relevance. So we're just going to go over how the spine works, how it develops, etc. So hopefully give you a better understanding of wh how, what things mean when they come through with the MRI and CT scan reports. Well, to start it simply, the spine is made up of 33 vertebrae, 24 of the mobile vertebrae, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, and 5 lumbar. So we have two dozen mobile vertebrae. And then the last nine vertebrae are fused. Five vertebrae form the sacrum, four form the coccyx. I think everyone is well aware of that. The numbering sequence is upside down, meaning that we start with the one is the most superior and the lower numbers are the, the most inferior vertebrae. And we number segments in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral regions. Again, common knowledge. However, it's not always that simple. Numbering can be difficult. Some people have a cervical rib. And I know all of you have had reports on chest x-rays, cervical spine, CT scans, etc., that report a cervical rib. Cervical ribs are present in about 2% of the population. They are usually unilateral, but occasionally are bilateral. And most of the time, cervical ribs are inconsequential. However, in about 10% of cases, people will present with findings that suggest some abnormality. The most common is a fullness at the base of the neck, and this is noted often in pediatric patients. Cervical ribs have been implicated as the cause of symptoms in a very small number of people. Remember, 2% of the population have cervical ribs. In a few hundred cases of vascular or neurogenic symptoms involved in the upper extremities have been reported in case studies and have received surgery for cervical ribs that were thought to contribute to upper extremity symptoms. So most of these do not produce symptoms. In addition, Another abnormality of numbering of vertebrae is the result of transitional vertebra vertebrae at the lumbosacral junction. These can be in several different forms. We can have sacralization of L5 in which part or all of L5 becomes part of the sacrum. That is present in about one in every 10 people. In addition, about 4% of the population have the opposite, in which the S1 vertebrae is partially incorporated into the lumbar spine, and we call that lumbarization of S1. And a third variant present in about 5% of the population is an enlarged articular, uh, articulating, excuse me, the third uh, abnormality is something called Bertolotti syndrome, which includes a transverse process that is enlarged and articulates with the sacral alar. And these, again, are quite common. All in total, about 20% of the population have transitional lumbosacral vertebrae. 
These are considered incidental findings. The most important reason for identifying these is that they can make numbering of the vertebrae uh, a bit of a challenge. In every day, in spine practices and in spine radiology groups, we struggle with correctly numbering vertebrae that are transitional. This is extremely important for cases of surgery as the incorrect identification of a vertebrae based on a fluoroscopic shot that is done before surgery can lead to the wrong level surgery. It's also important for spinal procedures which are targeting a specific nerve. Unless we clearly identify the correct vertebral level, we can miss by one level up or down. However, transitional vertebrae themselves are not considered the cause of symptoms. Very rarely, Bertolotti syndrome, uh, the articulation with the sacrum and the transverse process of L5 can become arthritic. And even in these cases, it's often not on the side of symptoms. So we don't even know if these are relevant for symptom production. Well, we all know that the vertebrae are aligned with these beautiful curves. There is a lordosis in the cervical region, a kyphosis in the thoracic region, and then lordosis again in the lumbar region. And on, in the coronal plane, the spine appears straight. But there are developmental abnormalities that can alter this. And those developmental abnormalities, uh, we call in the coronal plane, we call scoliosis, as you know. And we have a few cases of congenital scoliosis where people are born with a wedged vertebrae that requires other vertebrae to curve in order to correct the spine posture. Also in musculoskeletal, excuse me, in neuromuscular diseases, we have abnormalities of muscle tone that can lead to scoliosis. However, the most common type of developmental scoliosis is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Scoliosis is measured when we want to quantify it with a Cobb's angle, and these are just uh, routinely done by orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, and radiologists to measure the actual degrees. And when children present with scoliosis, these numbers are followed very carefully to determine if scoliosis is progressive. Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis occurs in about 3% of the population. It's twice as common in girls than in boys. It's highly familial. However, we have not yet identified the genes that are responsible for this. It is most likely that this disorder is the result of a combination of susceptibility genes in which females are much more vulnerable than males. Much work has been done to identify these genes, and unfortunately, it's all been very frustrating to date. We have not identified any clear gene markers for this. Obviously, the most common abnormality produced by adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the postural deformity, and all of us look for this in our daily practice. There's also some increased prevalence of spinal pain, but it does not tend to be disabling pain. Many people with scoliosis, though, have pain, and it's more common in people with scoliosis than it is in people without. Also, when scoliosis is extremely severe, it can compromise the anatomy of the thorax enough to cause pulmonary compromise. That is something that we do not see very often, thank goodness. The second abnormality of vertebral alignment that you will often see is Shorman's kyphosis. Shorman's kyphosis is a deformity in the thoracic region caused by abnormal growth of the mid-thoracic vertebrae in which the anterior part of the vertebrae does not enlarge as much as the posterior part, leading to a wedge deformity. Uh, Shorman's kyphosis is defined as a 45 degree uh, uh, kyphosis and it's again measured with a Cobb angle. It's present in about 3% of the population and it's somewhat familial, although less clearly familial than is scoliosis. The actual genes for this have not yet been identified. The implications of Shorman's kyphosis are simply a postural deformity, and there's also increased frequency of thoracic pain in this population. A little bit about the vertebral morphology. All of you know uh, this in, 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 in really quite a bit of detail from your 
initial studies, uh, but the top two vertebrae are the atlas and axis, and they are simply designed to help the head move on top of the spine. The joint between the occipital condyles and C1 is mainly used for flexion and extension, and between C1 and C2 is used for rotation. All the rest of the vertebrae have the same morphology in that there is a vertebral body and a posterior neural arch. The vertebral body is a cylindrical structure. It is flat in the top and bottom, and it's made with a combination of cortical bone and dense, with a dense trabecular bone center. It basically functions to bear the weight of the body, uh, and this is shared by both the cortical and trabecular bone. What is of interest is that both the cortical bone and trabecular bone are less robust near the superior end plate. And it is felt that this is why when you see your elderly patients with compression fractures, it virtually always involves the superior and not inferior end plate of the vertebrae. The neural arch, the posterior neural arch, includes several different parts. There are the pedicles, which are two posts that stick from the back of the vertebral body, and then there is the lamina that connect those two posts. From the lamina project the transverse processes, the spinous processes, and the articular processes that form the facet joints. The neural arch defines the spinal canal. Again, this is just simple, straightforward things. Of importance, however, is that the length of the pedicles is a major determinant of the dimensions of the spinal canal. You will see MRI and CT report reports uh, on your patients that suggest that there are congenitally shortened pedicles, and therefore this contributes to lumbar spinal stenosis. The pedicles are also notched above and below, and these notches line up between adjacent vertebrae to form the neural foramina. What does the neural arch do? Well, first of all, it offers bony protection to the spinal cord and the cauda equinae, very much like the skull, offers bony protection to the brain. It also serves as an attachment point for muscles, and it assists slightly in weight bearing, about 15% of our weight we bear through the facet joints. But the most important thing for you to know is it helps to control the position and the movement between vertebrae. And this helps to determine both the anterior and posterior alignment and limit side flexion, rotation, extension, etc. Therefore, when you see a patient who has an abnormality of vertebral alignment, a spondylolisthesis or slippage of the vertebrae, etc., it means that there is a problem with the posterior neural arch. The neural arch is not doing its job. The spine, in addition to having its wonderful bones, has intervertebral discs, which are the soft structures that are between the vertebrae and allow for movement between the vertebrae. These account for about one quarter of the length of the spine, and this explains why as we age and these structures slowly decrease in size, why we lose some of our height. The intervertebral discs have two parts. The center is the nucleus pulposus, which is a tangle or Brillo pad-like structure filled with collagen fibers that attach to the vertebral end plates above and below. And this Brillo pad-like structure is impregnated with proteoglycan molecules that are extremely hydrophilic, attracting huge amounts of water into the disc, causing it to be about 80% water when we are young. As we get older, that water content tends to slowly drop. This high water content allows the nucleus pulposus to be deformable, and that allows us to move one vertebrae on top of the other, and the nucleus pulposus simply deforms to fill the space in between those. And because it is also highly uh, impregnated with water, it has hydraulic characteristics in terms of transferring pressure between vertebrae. The outer part of the disc is called the annulus fibrosis. It is made up of collagen fibers. Collagen fibers do not stretch, and that is very important. It's made up of about 25 concentric rings in the lumbar region, less in the uh, thoracic region, and a few rings only in the cervical re regions. These uh, bands bind to the end plates of the vertebrae above and below, 
thereby sealing the, the annulus fibrosus, seals the nucleus pulposus within the intervertebral space. These rings have extraordinary tensile strength, but also have enough give to allow for movement between the vertebrae. The discs are living structures. There are nuclear cells that maintain the nucleus pulposus and annular cells that maintain the annulus fibrosus. And the function of these cells is essential for the proper development and maintenance of this structure. What does the intervertebral do? It has several different functions. First, as mentioned earlier, it joins the vertebrae together by binding the one vertebrae to the next through the, the periphery of the vertebral bodies. The second thing it does is it allows motion between vertebrae and it allows the structure to be in between the vertebrae that can change its shape as motion occurs. The third is that it absorbs compression forces of the spine and evenly distributes that between vertebrae. Now, as the intervertebral discs deteriorate, these functions beco can become slightly compromised, and that will be talked about in a, later today. As we go through our day, we generate extraordinary intervertebral pressures, interdiscal pressures. And these occur with all postures. Even lying down, we have pressure within the intervertebral discs. When we sit, there are more pressures, stand more pressures, bend, lift things. The pressures become quite high. The disc is designed to withstand these pressures. These pressures are not abnormal. This is what the disc does. Indeed, the discs are so strong that before they will fail, the surrounding bone will fail. Experiments have been done in which a disc is placed and the two adjacent ver a disc and its two adjacent vertebrae are placed in a press, which is slowly then increased. Okay, I'm going to get this right here. Where the disc and adjacent vertebrae are pressed in a device that slowly compresses the entire structure and the vertebral bodies collapse before the intervertebral disc fails. We see two examples of this in clinical practice. The first we see are Schmerl's nodes, which are a failure of the vertebral end plates that occur oftentimes during the adolescent growth spurt as intervertebral debt pressures become quite large, as the teenager is running around and doing things so large that this material is propelled into the vertebral bodies, which are still developing and somewhat soft. In addition, we see burst fractures when people have some type of trauma, such as falling from a tree or a bad motor vehicle accident, and huge compression forces are placed on the spine, the vertebrae you know, are crushed by this, but the intervertebral discs tolerate this quite well. The spine also has a variety of ligaments. There are very specialized ligaments between the occiput and C2. The interesting thing about these ligaments is that they are adjacent to synovial membranes and therefore they are susceptible to inflammatory processes that involve the synovium such as rheumatoid arthritis. And all people who take care of people with, excuse me, and all clinicians who take care of people with rheumatoid arthritis know about the risks of damage to these ligaments with advanced inflammatory disease that can lead to subluxation of the spine and compression of the spinal cord, a very dangerous situation. In addition, we have, through the remainder of the spine, we have the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. These are very strong ligaments that run through the entire spine and join the vertebrae together, and they limit flexion and extension between the vertebral bodies. In the back, between the lamina, we have a very interesting ligament that you will hear about all the time in your reports, especially in elderly people. And these are the ligamentum flavum. They connect the lamina, and they define the posterior wall of the spinal canal. These ligaments are unique in that they contain elastin, which allows them to expand and contract with motion. This is much better than if they do not have elastin, which happens later in life, at which point movements are associated with a buckling or folding of the ligaments, and that can compromise the dimensions of the spinal canal. 
In addition, within the spinal canal, we have the spinal cord and its meninges, and we're not going to go over the anatomy of this. Of interest, however, the dimensions of the spinal cord are usually about one half of that of the spinal canal. And so there's quite a bit of room within the spinal canal to allow for movements of the spinal cord during daily activities. In addition, that additional space allows for some degeneration to take place over time that will slightly compromise the spinal canal in most people. The spinal canal dimensions can vary between individuals with some people having a relatively small spinal canal and other people having a very robust canal. And that can make a difference in terms of the ability of the spinal cord in other neurological uh, structures to tolerate advancing degeneration. The spinal cord and meninges are, are surrounded by the subarachnoid space in which there is a CSF, and that CSF is used for imaging. The CSF on T2 MRI studies becomes white, and we use that to outline the spinal cord, as you can see in this uh, MRI image. Outside of this, we have the epidural space. The epidural space has epidural fat. It's a rather small space, but it is the target for epidural anesthesia and epidural procedures that are often uh, used for spinal pain. The spinal cord is viewed in terms of 31 pairs of spinal nerve roots. There are both anterior and posterior nerve roots at every level. These are defined by the level in which these roots exit the spinal canal. In the cervical region, we have eight cervical spinal nerves. These are numbered in an interesting way as they are numbered by the vertebrae in which they exit above. However, since we have only seven vertebrae, the C8 nerve root is named as it exits between C7 and T1. All of the remaining spinal nerves are named by the vertebrae in which they exit below. And so in the lumbar region, the L5 nerve root exits below the L5 vertebrae. Always important to remember, the cervical is different than the remainder of the spine. Within the spinal canal, we have the terminal aspect of the spinal cord, which is the conus medullaris. This usually terminates between L1 and L2. This is a very useful marker for identifying the uh, lumbar vertebrae in that the radiologist will often identify the termination of the conus medullaris and then look at axial views through that segment to determine where the 12th ribs are and count down from the 12th, rib, 12th ribs to the end of the spinal cord and therefore identify which vertebrae they are uh, is numbered L1, L2, L3, etc. This is especially important in those with transitional lumbosacral vertebrae. The Conus medullaris ends much higher than the spinal canal in general because the spinal canal continues to grow long after the spinal cord stops its growing. This discrepancy is about one half in the cervical region and by the lumbar region becomes between two and nine levels. The, ca the cauda equinae uh, is the extension of nerve roots below the conus medullaris within the lumbar and sacral regions. We all know about this because of the importance of cauda equinae syndrome. Now, of importance in this area is that the nerve roots where they coalesce to actually have nerve root sleeves occurs really usually about one segment above the, the exit of the actual nerve roots. And this leads to vulnerability to compression up to one level above the exit point. So an L5 nerve root can be compressed at the L4-5 level. An S1 nerve root can be compressed at the L5-S1 level. The spine has an extraordinary number of muscles involved with its stability and movements. These muscles originate within the spine itself and also uh, can originate from the periphery and attached to the spine. The most important paraspinal muscles in terms of bulk are the outer muscles, which are the erector spinae and the splenius. 
These, occur, these are the bulk of the muscles that are involved with producing extension force in the spine and global positioning of the spine. In addition, we have a large number of deep muscles that work over one to four spinal segments. These can as assist with extension. They can also assist with side flexion and rotation and are probably extremely involved with fine control of the position and movements of the vertebrae. We also have distant muscles that affect the spine, such as the sternocleidomastoid, which is involved with rotating the cervical spine and the head, obviously, and the abdominal muscles that are involved with flexion and rotation of the lumbar spine. Overall, the spine has 200 muscles that are involved with movements. and the lumbar region alone, there are 70 muscles involved with the position and movement of the vertebrae. And this allows extraordinary strength along with a wide variety of motions, which all of us appreciate uh, on a regular basis, both personally and watching others move and work. In order to have such a complicated system of muscles, we must have a complicated sensory motor system that regulates this, and indeed we do. This is not clearly understood at this time, but we know that the spine receives input from mechanical receptors of all types, including Golgi tendon, including Golgi tendon, organs, muscle spindles, and mechanical receptors that are in the ligaments, facet joints, discs, bones, etc. Input from these is used to help to regulate positions and movements of the vertebrae and tell the 200 muscles what to do as we go through our daily activities. The majority of the integration of messages apparently occurs at the interneuron level within the spinal cord. And this is something that we know about, but we do not know as much as we would like to know about this process. But this whole complicated system allows extraordinary responses to the stresses on the spine, tissue tension, etc. It also, because it is neuron-based, uh, uh, there is the potential for learning. And it's extremely dynamic, meaning that this, this process of integration of sensory and motor information is something that we are adapting to all the time as we grow, as we change our physical and vocational activities, and as we age and degenerate our spines. Thank you for watching this quite simple uh, online presentation about the normal anatomy and variants of the spine. I hope that you find the tidbits that we've thrown out helpful for understanding the readings that you are receiving on your x-rays, MRI scans, etc. We are now going to move into topics which much more meet, we hope, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this presentation.